15 minute talk, so just so people know, we're not gonging in the bod, we'll be gonging a little later. That's crazy. Okay, so as mentioned, I, I'm here, I'm talking a little bit about a model that I've been working on with uh, the ostrich, the musculoskeletal model, and my collaborators, Don Hutchinson and Jonas Rubinson. There are a lot of reasons that we want to use musculoskeletal models, and uh, they specifically I'm interested in understanding about the, mus the roles of muscles and kind of taking what Steve's talking about one step further and understanding how the muscle coordination helps create the movements in, in birds and animals in general. Uh, the idea is uh, specifically, I, I actually come from a human clinical background, so I'm interested in understanding how birds like ostriches or other bipeds are different from humans to give some insights into to human movement as well. So I want to understand, you know, how, what are the muscle roles, how do, how do they help us, and how do uh, muscles coordinate together. Um, we can answer a lot of these questions to help us understand function structure relationships in both extinct and extant species. So that's kind of my collaborator's point of view. Uh, and it can provide us a lot of basic insights into, into how bipeds move. And of course, what's of most interest here, for, I think, for most of you, is that how can we have these muscle roles influence or, or inspire the development of biomimetic robots or other types of assistive devices? So you can ask questions like, what muscles are most critical to performing a given movement? You know, what muscles are the critical ones for walking in, in a bird versus in a human? And then how can we translate into that, into to building a robot or, or using that to exploit that? make robotic devices. So why ostriches? Well, ostriches are, are in some ways similar to humans. They're, they're similar weight, between 100 and 120 kilograms, so a, a relatively large adult human, but still similar in size. Uh, they're also bipedal, uh, but they're, they're very different as well. They're extremely cursorial, which means they come from an evolutionary background where they're used to running away from predators, they're, they're prey species. As a result, they're very efficient at running fast, uh, using low energy, and they're also very good at maneuvering. So they're very good at turning quickly while at speed. As people, we're not very good at that when we're running fast. Uh, so, so we can look at those animals, look at ostriches, and, and understand how that's different from humans. <coughs> Previous studies, and Steve mentioned a bunch of these, is, have, have kind of looked at kinematics uh, of, of ostriches and movements, and, and we'll, I'll be taking, looking at that a little bit more in detail, and then taking that one step further with the model, uh, as well as joint kinetics so, and metabolic cost. So the reason that, that we use musculoskeletal models, or that I use musculoskeletal models uh, from, from clinical background is that they're, they're really useful. They've been shown to be quite useful in human studies. They've answered questions such as individual muscle roles during a variety, wide variety of movements, both lower extremity like cycling and walking here, as well as upper extremity movements. They've also provided information about muscle quantities that we can't really get empirically very easily. So if you want to know muscle stress or, or muscle forces, fiber and tendon work, those aren't very easy to get empirically. So using a model allows us to do that without being uh, so invasive on the animals and, and limiting the, the, the use of animals. And the last thing that, that's great about models, and all of you will appreciate this, is that we can perform theoretical studies to, to determine, get more information into form and function. So if we knock out a muscle, how does the model respond? If we strengthen a muscle, how does the model respond? To give us insights into how these muscles might be, have developed and, and are coordinated. So, so the objective of this study that, that we've been working on is to first develop a detailed ostrich musculoskeletal model, and second, kind of run it through its paces and, and, and create simulations of both walking and running to, to verify the models working and also to gain this insight that we're interested in to understand how ostriches might be different from humans and other animals. So this is kind of this is the, the overview of, of the way that the simulation runs. Basically, we'll have experimental data and a musculoskeletal model that we've developed to come together, uh, perform inverse dynamics, and then use this step called quasi-static optimization to, to parse out the, the joint torques into muscle forces, do some sort of objective function, 
and then afterwards we can analyze the individual muscle data. I think we're all familiar with inverse dynamics in, the, in this group, so I'm not going to go into much detail, but basically we take kinematic data and force data, uh, position data, take some derivatives to get the acceleration of the joints, uh, use those with the ground reaction forces and our equations of motion or to be able to get our musculoskeletal model, or with our musculoskeletal model to get our joint torques. Uh, as far as the quasi-static optimization goes, uh, we use that same musculoskeletal model with the, the detailed muscle information and the moment arms, and we include muscular tendon dynamics, so force length and force velocity relationships that are intrinsic to muscles, uh, and use those to solve a global objective of solving for the joint torques as well as minimizing some cost some sort of objective function. Okay. So the, the experimental data that we were going through is, was collected from a previous data set by our collaborators, Jonas Rubinson. Uh, it consists of a single subject, and we have two trials, one that's a walking trial for 1.2 meters per second, and a second that's a running trial of 3.2 meters per second. So it's a, a, a normal walk and then a relative slow run for an uh, And They collected kinematics, and Steve showed this, this picture already, three-dimensional kinematics using markers and high-speed video, uh, as well as kinetics from, from a ground force plates, six degree of freedom ground reaction forces. All that data was, was collected and well passed filter at 15 hertz. Uh, the musculoskeletal model is here on the right, and it was created from CT and scans and dissections, so the bones are actually CT scans of those bones, and the, the muscles are, are put there anatomically correct based on its dissection. Uh, it consists of 70 muscular tendon actuators, 35 on each side. These actuators represent 31 muscles per, per leg. Uh, they use what's called a hill type model, which includes the intrinsic force length velocity relationships. The model has 24 degrees of freedom total. Six degrees of freedom at the pelvis, so it's free to move in space, and then nine degrees of freedom at the leg. Three of them at the hip, three at the knee, two at the ankle, and one down at the bottom of the MTP joint. The next citation activation dynamics were, were modeled using a first order differential equation that represent the, the time delay between excitation neural signal and activation of a muscle. And here on the right, the, the animations, the, these are actually the uh, animations of the experimental data. So the, the one on the top is the walking, and then the one on the bottom is running. As far as the objective function goes, we, what, what we decided to use was to minimize activation squared of the muscles. Uh, this is similar to minimizing effort. So as we, I mentioned, the ostriches are really efficient in, in both walking and running, and have an idea that maybe they minimize effort as well as maximizing speed. So, so we uh, have the joint torques which are maximizing speed, and then we also minimize effort to try and parse out those muscles. And the data was uh, obtained for analysis between stance and swing. So let's look at the, the, the results here. So this looks really big and messy, and I just want to focus on a couple, couple of the muscles here. Okay, and we'll, we'll step through them quickly. So if we look at these in particular, what we have here is at the top we have our ankle and MTP extensors and flexors. Here we have a hip extensor, some hip rotators, and a knee extensor. Now what I want you to get from this slide more than anything is that in general, as we would expect, and this is kind of a, a model verification step, is that in running, activity of most of the muscles goes up quite intuitive considering that the demands on, on the joints are, are increased during running at higher speeds. Looking particularly at stance and swing, and once again we can split this up, we, we find that generally muscles are, are either working in stance, so they're really active in stance, so this is a digital flexor, so one that will push down a plantar flexor kind of muscle on, on the ground in stance, and then we have what would be a ankle dorsiflexor, or one that would pick up the ankle here and swing. So if we, in general, the muscles are either active in stance or swing. 
but we do find that some muscles seem to be, be doing a lot of activity in both. And I want to focus, we don't have much time, I wanted to focus specifically on the hip rotators here. So, so these muscles, and, and Steve actually led in quite well with this, saying that there's a lot of long axis rotation. So these muscles actually are responsible for long axis rotation in, in, in the femur. And what we can see is not only are they active during swing, but they also seem to be active during stance. Quite active. And, and as a result, what we can see is that, that these, these hip rotator muscles are probably playing an important role in stance and in propulsion and support, which is very different from humans. We don't really use our, our hip rotators as much. Um, as I mentioned, muscle activity and force provides a clear distinction between the extent muscles and stance and swing. Uh, there was a lot of high activity in, in our ankle extensors and our digital flexors, which we expected, especially during run. These, these muscles are, are designed in, in an osteus such that they have very long tendons for energy storage and return and seem to indicate that they're using springs to uh, save energy as they're running. And then as I mentioned, hip adductors and rotators seem to play an important role in stance and swing during walking and running. Uh, so I'm out of time, so I'll skip that. Uh, just to give you an overview of what we're going. Basically, we want to continue to put this model through the paces. It would be ideal to get some EMG data to test our simulation valve validity, uh, obtain muscle fiber and tendon specific work to specifically look at the energy storage and return in those tendons of, of, of the osteos, and simulate different speeds and conditions. And lastly, we also want to compare dynamic and static optimizations to see if running true forward dynamic simulations provide different results or similar results. I thank you for your time. And Happy to have questions. I just want to acknowledge my sponsors. They're part of this project partially funded by BBSRC and NSF. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Jerry Pratt for the members of IHMC Fast Runner for inviting me down today. Thank you. Each of the muscle has a maximum isometric force and a maximum potential around a given joint. Um, the activations are, are scaled accordingly. So a large muscle would, for, for it to produce, or one that has high potential to produce a joint, uh, torque about a joint, would re relatively have a lower activation because it has a higher potential. So it doesn't need as much of an activation level. So it, it kind of balances out uh, the muscles, the muscle use. So if you have a small muscle that can potentially do that, provide a torque, but it doesn't have as high of a potential, it would end up with a high activation. So this kind of preferentially picks muscles that are more suitable for producing a torque around the user zone. And, and the idea is that that's minimizing overall metabolic cost. Middle here. Uh, yeah, a question about your optimization. So you showed your cost function as a sum of AM terms squared. What was the AM? So the, the A is the activation for each given muscle. The activation level is scaled from zero to one, from no activation to maximum. I see. And uh, and, and a follow up. Uh, do you is there a significant uh, research or do you, is it known in the field that that's how the animal optimizes as well, or is it, that a best guess? It's not. That's a best guess. So we know in, in human walking at least that that's minimizing energetic energy cost is is what we do. When it comes to running and, and high performance, it may not be. And that is a limitation. And one of the reasons we want to go to forward dynamics is so that we can get move away from the minimizing cost and really see if there's some other objective, such as maximizing speed or something along those lines. Thank you. There's a question in the back. What's the question? Um, do you know what the focal contraction plays in the work? What was that? No, we, we don't know the role, and that's one of the things that we're, we're hoping to be able to find out a little bit more in this, in this model. Uh, 
uh, and that's where having EMG data and electromyographic data would be really helpful. But as you can imagine, trying to get electromyographic data from a fast-running ostrich is, is a challenge. Andy, did you have a question? Uh, I'll try. I think it's covered, but you have no EMG data. You have no. You have not. You have nothing to check this. Yeah, so, so we don't have any EMG data to test our, our muscle activity. So what we've, we've done is we looked at the other bird literature and, and try and check our activations and excitations similar to other birds. And, and we find that in general they're, they're similar. The ones that are different, we, we're looking at closely and trying to understand why are they different. Does it make sense? Uh, because it is, it's, it's a challenge to, to validate the model. Uh, with that being said, if we are replicating the ground reaction forces and the kinematics. So, so the, there are some constraints that are already inherently built into the model based on that. But, but yes, if, if we need to get more in Dave, 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 in the back. Really loud, Dave. Now, this is an extension of the code attraction question. And I'm wondering if uh, any code attraction of the back of the model uh, emerges from the model. But it seems that it would be uh, discouraging to come here today to try to minimize the code of activation. Yeah. So, so we th it is discouraged, and uh, there is there is still quite a bit of code contraction that we find in the model, and it, it has partially, I think, a little bit to do with the fact that um, uh, for given two given muscles, one might not just be a flexor, but it's also an adductor, and one would be an abductor, so they have to have some code contraction still to maintain that, thing. especially like the knee, where we know there's three degree of freedom motion, there there still appears to be some code contraction. Uh, but yes, it does, it does try and minimize the co-contraction, which may not be our objective, especially in our ostrich running. They may be just trying to go as fast as they can, regardless of cost. It's cool that you still see some. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. In your environment, when you, when you do inverse dynamics, do you uh, incorporate also the uh, linear manual accelerations of the free body? Uh, and do you include also reaction forces, information to get the proper Yes, we include the reaction forces and work from bottom up. We do have some residuals on, on the top, but the, the pelvis is free to move, right? So we try and incorporate the acceleration to the body as well. Okay, thanks, Jeff.